Well, it is a busy day in the WHAS 11 newsroom as we follow two developing stories tonight at 5 o'clock. I'm Shay McAllister. And I'm Doug Prophet. First here tonight after years of searching, an arrest has been made in the Southern Indiana murder case. You'll remember a little boy found dead inside a suitcase. It stunned the small town in Washington County, Indiana. Plus, tornadoes leaving behind serious damage in Jefferson County, Indiana. Today, crews are starting the process of cleaning up at homes and businesses that were rocked by that storm. But first, we start in Sellersburg, where Indiana State Police announced a huge break in a case we all remember. The mother of the little boy killed and left in a suitcase in Washington County has now been found and arrested. His body was found. His name was unknown at the time. We later learned Cairo Jordan was just five years old. Now, nearly two years later, his mother and another woman are charged in connection to his death. His mother arrested in California, Los Angeles area today. WHS 11's Connor Steffens in Southern Indiana. Indiana State Police also made the announcement. Connor? Well, Doug, a break in the case came earlier this week when officers received a tip from a concerned citizen regarding Anderson's whereabouts. ISP says that officers arrested John Anderson last night without incident in Arcadia, California, on a warrant issued out of right here in Washington County, Indiana. She's being held at a Los Angeles Police Department Detention Center in Van Nuys, California, with ISP en route as we speak to transfer her back to Indiana. She faces charges of murder, neglect of a dependent resulting in death, and obstruction of justice, all felony charges in connection with the death of her son, Cairo Amar Jordan. Again, you have to remember, this is a break in the case two years in the making for ISP. We asked them how it felt to finally have tracked down Anderson after all this time. It's still a sorrowful and a, a somber moment uh, in the investigation, um, but it's something we've looked forward to and anticipated for almost two years now. I'm just very happy for those men and investigators who've really done everything they can and to have uh, the, the break, the information that they needed that we knew would come. Now, we asked ISP what state Anderson was in at the time of her arrest. All they could tell us was that police apprehended her while she was boarding public transit, so she was aware and mobile. ISP says it doesn't appear that Anderson or Cairo had any ties to the L.A. area. They say, to their knowledge, no one appears to have been helping her hide out in California. Now, we do want to tell you we just came from the cemetery where five-year-old Cairo is buried. Workers there tell us that after all this time, people still come to visit his grave daily. So it's hard to underscore just what this news means for this community. As one local put it, if anything, at least there's a sense of closure two years later. We're live in Salem, Indiana. Connor Steffen, WHAS 11, on your side. All right, Connor, thanks for the update. There is another woman sentenced in connection to the death of five-year-old Cairo Jordan. Last November, Don Coleman pleaded guilty to helping Dijon Anderson kill Cairo and hide his body. Coleman was sentenced to 25 years in prison and five years of probation. As part of her plea agreement, she will need to testify against Anderson in any criminal proceedings related to the little boy's death. After his death, Washington County, Indiana community made sure the boy was not alone. The town of Salem, Indiana held a memorial for Cairo Jordan when they finally learned the boy's name. Cairo turned out to be from Atlanta and his family actually joined the small town in celebrating the boy's life. The people of Salem also bought a headstone for him engraved with in loving memory of a beloved little boy known but to God. But once they learned his name, they had it added also to this memorial. Now we move to the other top story today, the severe weather damage in both southern Indiana and Kentucky. Overnight storms adding to the damage seen yesterday afternoon. The National Weather Service confirming at least one EF2 tornado. The path crossing over the Ohio River at Madison, Indiana, right into Kentucky, across the river from Madison, that's Milton, Kentucky. So far, that appears to be the hardest hit area. But we are still learning today. Strong and deadly storms also hit north of us in Indiana, right near the Ohio border. Our team coverage of the destruction continues today. Christina San Juan will fill us in on what our weather looks like moving forward. Also, Isaiah Kim Martinez is in Milton, Kentucky. But first, WHS 11's Jose Alonzo and photojournalist Jessica Farley are live near the Sandy Beach campground. And Jose, you've been there today, and these folks tried to start their cleanup last night when another round of severe weather actually came through that area. Doug, yes, it's been an 
an, an intense situation for the residents here. And we're gonna get right to that and speak a little bit more about that in the story later today. But I wanted to talk about how we did talk to uh, John Gordon and he's with the National Weather Service. He was surveying this area, this RV park we're at right now. But I wanna show you what we've been looking at all day today. Take a look right over here of a camper or at least what's left of a camper over there. Looks like it was completely tossed smashed even and it's wrapped around in metal a lot of these campers had metal awnings right on top of them this one looks like it's completely twisted around this camper and again this is what we've been looking at all day what awkward. residents have been dealing with all day as well and we can still see people picking up the pieces there are some people right behind that structure at this moment picking up those pieces and gordon told me that most of these people that come here they come for a vacation spot they put a lot of investment into these the these campers and everything that's out here but I do want to go ahead and take a look at some of the footage that we did get driving through the thick of it driving through this campground you can clearly see multiple other campers tossed around and debris across the road Gordon told me that what he's seeing here reminds him of a tornado back in March of 2012 but that thankfully no one was hurt in this one Several retirees are very upset. They're glad they're okay, but this was their life savings. They came here, they waited two years to get here, and then they have this. Uh, severe weather can happen at any time of day or night, and I just hate to see this. You can see things wrapped around the trees, clear signs that Gordon told us helps him determine this was an EF2 tornado. And he compared it to something that you would see in Oklahoma, especially in the way it developed. And back to what we're seeing here, we're looking at a pond we're standing right next to. There is debris completely it just in this entire pond there's actually a refrigerator right next to me it looks like it washed up next to the shore and it's just again we're painting the picture of what these families are going through and coming up right at six you're going to be we're going to be taking a deeper look into one woman's story of how she's trying to find a ray of sunshine within all this disaster reporting live in madison indiana jose alonzo whas 11 on your side all right, Jose, thank you very much. Well, checking in now on power outages in Kentucky. Thousands are still in the dark, but as you can see, it's isolated in Trimble and Carroll counties. Senior reporter Isaiah Kim Martinez and photojournalist Emma Gefter are in Trimble County, where the top priority right now is getting that power restored. Isaiah. Shay, you got it. It truly is the race to return power for thousands living here in Trimble County. Authorities also estimating up to 100 homes damaged in some way, shape or form. But thankfully, no serious injuries, no deaths, but still the damage to some of these homes is still devastating for families. We have some technical difficulties here with that piece, but again, this is a situation where we are waiting for that power to come right back up. Authorities estimate maybe about midnight could potentially be the timeline for that. Obviously, that would be a joy for so many. And then, of course, they're trying to get the roads back open by tonight. The governor estimating that could take a few days. So truly still a work in progress for recovery. And we have those 30 families, Shay and Doug, who are just across town east of here in Carrollton for temporary housing there. Those, of course, are the folks who have been displaced. We'll have this full story a little later on tonight. Guys. Thank you very much. Farther northeast, Logan County, Ohio, was hit by probable tornadoes. Right now, three people are dead after an RV park was destroyed, but cadaver dogs and search and rescue crews are on site. Over the Indiana border in Winchester, Indiana, about 40 injuries are being reported. As of now, there are no reported deaths. Let's check in with meteorologist Christina San Juan right now. Christina, two waves of severe weather last night. Our severe weather coverage, we went off the air at 1220 in the morning with that round of storms. Right. And I know you've been getting new information on the tornadoes that hit earlier in the afternoon that we've just been reporting about. 
Right, those are the ones that we have Isaiah and Jose out at right now and I have brand new information from the National Weather Service just in in the last couple of minutes. Didn't even have time to put it on a graphic just yet. It's the preliminary damage survey results from their uh, damage survey that they've been conducting for the last uh, last night and for all of today for that matter. The uh, peak winds, 115 miles per hour, the length. So they're saying the tornado was on the ground for 17.2 miles as well the max width of the tornado was up to 500 yards. So I'll continue to work with the National Weather Service and get more information on that tornado, of course, but we're so thankful that it's quiet out there today, albeit it's pretty gray and a few of us are just dealing with some lighter showers, but that's about it. We'll certainly take this type of weather over what we were dealing with uh, this time yesterday, but you can see just those very light sprinkles that are uh, going around uh, Dare County and also Passing off to our east, our 24-hour temperature change is quite significant. If you remember, we made it to 82 degrees yesterday. Right now, we're about 29 degrees colder than we were 24 hours ago. Sitting in the lower 50s for the most part, Bowman Field checking in at 50 degrees. So as we go into the next couple of hours, uh, clouds will stick around for us at least through sunset. But then as they begin to break up overnight, temperatures are going to be able to drop down into the upper 30s and lower 40s. So cold out the door, but don't worry, recovering nicely into the afternoon. We have a cold end to winter, though, on Monday. I'll tell you just how cold coming up in just a bit. Doug and Shay. Thank you very much. We want to continue our coverage now. We want to go back up to uh, Isaiah, where he was telling us about the storm damage coverage there. Isaiah, give us again um, a piece of that story in Milton, Kentucky. I'll show you, Doug. It's in the words of so many that have been through so much here in the last 24 hours. Take a listen. From our Sky 11 drone, the aftermath of an EF2 tornado whipping across state lines from southern Indiana into Milton, Kentucky. It was quick, very quick, fast. Leaving destruction in its path. Hail, real loud hail. 83-year-old Carol Coghill still processing the moments when the storm hit. Everything you had just like went <laughs> gone. Guess anybody would be scared when things happen like that, you know. Standing in his home, he watched his roof ripped off piece by piece, debris falling all around him, but not on him. I feel awful about it because uh, this is my retirement home. Right along the Ohio River, campers flattened. Confused, very confused. Ray DeRocher is devastated. I was sitting there and I, I do uh, paint by numbers. I was sitting at the kitchen table there and painting and looking out, watching the barges go by. And then this all of a sudden come up and out the door I went and I locked it, took off. He tells me he was sitting inside just 20 minutes before the tornado touched down, but he decided to go get his mail from his property over in Madison, Indiana. All of a sudden something told me, get out. A decision he believes saved his life. Oh no, they would have probably never found me. With what's left there, then ain't, ain't no way to have found me. Another trailer just down the road flipped upside down. Obviously, everything inside's tore up, but it's fine. It's nothing of, like I said, luckily it was still prior to when we would normally be here. The focus is now on recovery. 83% of our uh, of our county is still out of power. So it's, it's not just a Milton thing, it's entire Bedford is almost out too. KU crews are working to restore power to thousands of people in Trimble County who also don't have running water. We have generators in route, if not already unseen, that are hopefully working to get water restored. Emergency Management Director Andrew Stark says they hope to have power back by midnight Friday and most of the roads clear by the evening. For now, you can't replace a life that you can replace. This small town of 600 tells me they're grateful to have avoided the worst possible outcome. And of course, the governor declaring a state of emergency to make it easier to bring resources quickly to this area. He will be here in Milton, Kentucky tomorrow at 830 in the morning. Doug Shea. Isaiah, thank you.
More late breaking news here today at five o'clock. We did learn new information today about a house fire in southern Indiana that revealed four members of a family dead inside. This happened back in December, not far from Madison, Indiana. The Jefferson County, Indiana prosecutor today releasing the new details. The coroner found 12 year old Adelia, eight year old Leland and six year old Isla Briner were shot before that fire. Investigators say the children's mother, Naomi Brimer, Briner shot them before then taking her own life that day. Firefighters found the four inside the home near Madison on December 12th. Prosecutor David Sutter calling it a tragic case, adding his heart goes out to the families involved. And today, new court documents in the Crystal Rogers case claim the prosecution has little hard evidence, including, quote, no crime scene, no murder weapon, no realistic motive. Brooks Houck's attorneys are behind the documents. They are now fighting back against the prosecutor's request to combine all three trials. They claim that would result in prejudice against Brooks Houck. The documents claim both Joseph and Steve Lawson were subject to a bias investigation using coercive interrogation tactics, all with the goal of building a case against Brooks Houck. All of this makes next Thursday's court date more and more interesting. Just a reminder, that's coming up on Thursday, March 21st at 1 p.m. City of Louisville celebrating tonight. The new recruits stepping up to be our first responders. Take a look. The full graduating class for Metro Safe here. These call takers and dispatchers train for more than 300 hours to work in 911 communications. And they are the first people called in case of an emergency. You need them fast. Because of recent retirements, Metro Safe is down about 12, about a dozen positions. The next academy for Metro Safe begins mid-April.